Down south, the the Democrats got an interesting defeat in the last week. For those of us who are watching the news on a daily basis, I one day got a book called The Trump Prophecies. And the guy said, whenever they will try to stop in any which way, God will come against them in a way that everyone will know. And it sure seems to be happening every time. And for those of you who are not familiar with this, the globalists, the Illuminati, the Bilderbergers, and all those guys, they wanted a one world government. And if you read Revelations, you know there is a one world government, but it will be in God's timing not the timing of the human race. This is what I like about God. He gives you something, and then he fulfills it. And then Satan tries to duplicate it, and somehow gets people totally confused. But in the end, God always comes out the winner. And we're seeing incredible stuff happening. The power of the Holy Spirit. The letter rains, I I believe, are going to start. And we'll see a short work being done on this earth. And you need to get ready. How do you need to get ready? When a soldier asks you to carry his equipment one mile, you have to carry it two miles. Is that the way to get ready? No. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What does it truly mean to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ in the four Gospels has some interesting commands. You shall not 
think of murdering a person. If you do, it's like killing him. So there you feel automatically in the teachings of Jesus. We need to understand that God did something. He became the propitiation for our sins, meaning he was the sacrificial lamb that took care of the sin problem. He judged sin. Sin was judged at the cross. And this free gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not that we work for it. We accept it as a gift. All the good things that we do are the fruit of Christianity. It's not Christianity itself. Christianity means you need to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. I want to read you something very interesting. When you try to grasp the truth of the word through information, listen to this. I'm teaching here. That's information. I'm giving you information. When you try to grasp the truth of the word through information instead of revelation, you will not get the full picture. So salvation has to be a revelation from God to you. Never mind information from me. For you to get the full picture. When God gives you the revelation, you know that you know that you belong to God. When I give you the information, somebody else can come along and give you some other information. And you may sway over to the other guy's teaching. So a revelation from God can never be undone. How is that? I have had... A revelation, who I am in Christ, nobody can talk me out of it. Not even a bullet or an axe to the head or to the neck. You cannot do it. It's there for keeps. Hallelujah. So God wants us to understand that. And once we become his purchased possession, we belong to him. So today, I will teach on a subject. If I would give it a name, I would call it once saved and always saved. And that's just to dig a finger into the eyes of the religious. I am saved once and for keeps. I have become perfect in Christ Jesus. Do you want to know how it's done? I will give you the scriptures today. It has to be a revelation, though. And for you to get that revelation, you have to study it for yourself. You have to seek it out from God yourself. My information is just to make you jealous and to get you into searching. So today we'll start doing that. But before we get into it, let's rise and ask the Lord for blessing. Heavenly Father, you will open people's hearts today. You will open our hearts to the truth of Scripture. Help us to understand and see this life-giving joy and peace that you have for us. I thank you for your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you today as you open your eyes and hearts. A person who becomes a Christian has a peace in his heart that passes all understanding. Why and what is that peace? Knowing that you know that you belong to God. Since I've become a Christian at the age of about 27, I have had that peace. Of course, it wasn't always peaceful, but the peace in my heart with God was sure and steady. Because when I became a Christian, I started a relationship. And that relationship has grown, and it'll grow throughout eternity. Hallelujah. It'll never stop growing as I get to know God more and more. 
But I want to ask a question. Can a person, once he's born again, once he's a new creation in Christ, can he still fall away from God? And many people, many Christians will swear by their heads that a person can still fall away. Let's see what the Bible says, and I'll use some of the scriptures that are pet scriptures from those naysayers, from those who say, yes, God will still lose you eventually if you don't watch yourself, if you don't keep yourself. You can fall away. You can walk away from God. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 4, listen to this. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they have crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open chain. So here it is. For those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, it looks like it's talking about a Christian here. But I want to clarify this scripture. Before you can understand and see the way into the kingdom of God, you have to, your eyes have to be opened by the Holy Spirit. There's nobody else that can show you. It's that heavenly gift and you taste it. Has anybody ever here seen a wine taster on TV? Is anybody here a wine taster? You know what a wine taster is. They taste the wine and they spit it out. And this is what the word taste means. You taste and see whether you like something to eat or you to drink. What do you do if you don't like it? You spit it out. And this is what the King James Version uses. It uses the word taste. You've tasted of God and you've tasted of the power of the world of, uh, to come and you fall away, meaning you do not want it. It is useless to try to renew that person again to repentance by praying for him. Forget about it. Because he now knows. There is a scripture that teaches us, this person, put him away from you, withdraw your prayers, give him over to Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, for the saving of your soul. If you have a, a kid or a child or a friend who knows exactly how salvation is, and you're praying for him, oh God, please watch out for that person. Please bring him to yourself. You're doing yourself an in favor. You give him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, to the saving of the soul. How does that work anyway? You stop praying for him. How many of you read the, word, the book, Whom This World Was Not Worthy? I read it. It's an incredible book from the 1940s. And here's what happened. This lady had a, her oldest son just went wild, came into music, started living for the devil, and the mother would, they would have a jig in a pub or something, and the mother would sit there right in front, of, in front of him and pray for him. And one day, the band decided they were going to move out of the province. They were going to go entertain. And the mother told the son, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to withdraw my prayers from you. You are now on your own. In two months, the son was back, very sick, and asking for prayer so that he will not die. It also happened to a, a lady friend of mine whose youngest son lived for the world, couldn't care less. She prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. For years, the kid lived for the devil, 
was into all sorts of stuff that wasn't good for him. And the, la the, the grandmother, she's already a grandmother, asked, God, what do I do? I have prayed so long. And God said, leave him to me. Just quit praying for him. Quit protecting him. Okay. She quit praying for him. It took a year. And the poor guy had to ask mom for prayer because he was starting to lose it. Things started working against him. Two true stories. One is true for sure because I know the lady and I know the guy. So God is telling us, don't interfere with my work because I'm going to do the impossible. That's a good way of putting it. I always tell my kids, don't try to sneak behind my, my back because I know exactly what you're doing. God and me have this, the, how do they call it, a local line that we talk to and it's not long distance and he doesn't charge and he usually whispers to me if you guys go off the right track. And guess what? They listen and hallelujah, they turn to God. In Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 26, listen to this scripture. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversary. Again, we have the scripture. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, what does sin willfully mean? We'll get to it. I'll explain the scripture and then we'll get on and it'll explain itself. But I used to think after I received the knowledge of the truth, after I've become born again, got baptized, and I sin willfully, it seems like there's no more sacrifice for my sin. I forfeited my salvation. No, this is not what it means. It simply means this. If we sin willfully by rejecting the truth after we have received the knowledge on how to get saved, there is no other sacrifice for your sin but a fiery indignation from God. And never mind that Mennonite preacher who puts out a, word, a book that there is no hell or whatever he wants to write. There is an eternal lake of fire. For those who reject God's invitation, it says fiery indignation. That sounds pretty hot to me when you study the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 28, look at this. He that despised Moses' loss died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Listen to this one, despised Moses' law. Not broke Moses' law, but despised it, hated it, didn't want nothing to do with it. He died under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose you shall be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. Now that sentence had me going for quite a while till the Lord give me the answer. He wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the spirit of grace. It seems as if you were sanctified already, you were a Christian already. But here is what the Bible truly may, uh, says about your salvation. At the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ cleansed the whole world from its sin. You're all sanctified, but there is one condition that is left to you. You have to accept it for yourself. Your salvation, whether you're born again or not, your salvation is done. It has been finished at the cross. The cross of Calvary did this work. It's finished. You're sanctified. 
you're purified. Can you imagine being in hell and knowing that you were pure and holy in the sight of God? All you had to do was accept it. That's going to be the biggest hell that a person can experience. It says wherewith you were sanctified already and you count it as whatever. It's no big deal. There's no power in it. It says he that despised Moses' law died without two, uh, two or three, died under two or three witnesses. And those, he says, how much sore punishment will those get who count the blood of the covenant as nothing but an unholy thing? Can you imagine the religious people out there who are living, trying to live for God, but when you tell them that Jesus is the only way into the kingdom, they thumb your nose, they thumb their noses at it. That's spitting God in the face. That's awful. He gave his only begotten son to pay for your sin and my sin. He was the sacrificial lamb that took the whole world's sin upon himself and paid for it. The fury of God was poured out upon him and he had to suffer to the point of sweat and blood. And there they stand. Oh, we don't quite trust that. We have to somehow help God in his offering. Just like Cain, he wanted to help God. But Abel brought the sacrificial lamb. Do you know that before the law was given, everybody was a law unto himself? They could do whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. And let me tell you, there are some interesting stories in the word of God before the law was given. And what did they have to do to atone for their sin? They had to bring a sacrificial lamb to cover their sin till the real sacrificial lamb came. That's when things were put in order. Just like God said to Adam and Eve, one day somebody will come that will straighten this out, and hallelujah, he did come. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man in, is, be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Once you accept Jesus, you are a new creature in Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul could say, I have wronged nobody. Even though he was out there killing the church, bringing them into prison, I have wronged no one. Why was he able to say that? Because his name was Paul and not Saul. Saul is the one that did all those horrifying things. He was the culprit. And you have a new name according to Revelation chapter 2. Once you become a new uh, born again Christian, once you become a new creation in Christ Jesus, God has a new name for you. Isn't that something? So all things are passed away because behold, all things become new. And this is what God wants us to understand. And then in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, it tells us, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. I know God is grieved. If somebody accepts Jesus as his Savior and still doubts his salvation. I wonder if Jesus really meant it. I wonder if I'm good enough for God. I wonder if the cross really did what the Bible says. On and on the excuses go. There are many, many Christians in mental institutions because they lack assurance of salvation. They're never good enough for themselves. They're always condemning themselves, not realizing that yesterday was yesterday. Today is a new page. God wants to start over again with you every minute of every day of every hour. So 
What is the problem? It's a lack of belief in what Jesus did on the cross for them. That's why they're troubled. That's why they're into depression and all these things. There's no peace in their heart. The teachers that teach them are on the wrong track. They need to teach people that God, with God, it's a done deal. Once you accept him as your savior, you become holy, pure in the eyes of God, as if you've never done anything wrong. That's what God meant when he told Adam and Eve, I'm going to send somebody that will straighten this out. You become just like Adam and Eve were before the fall, once you accept Jesus. It's your spirit man that is holy and pure, and your soul will follow along with it, and the flesh has to go into the ground. You can never tame that thing until you get to be about 80 years old, and that's because it has to be in a wheelchair. That's what God and the Bible thinks of the flesh that we so proudly present to everybody. So, where do you stand with that? Do you believe God's word? Or do you believe that computer program that is in your brain that was with you since you were young? I eradicated mine, and hallelujah, since then, then I've had peace in my heart. Now listen to this one, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show yourself you're approved of God. It's not you studying and then God approves of you. No, it's the other way around. Study the word. Show yourself that God approves of you. That's what this scripture means. Study to show thyself your proof unto God. Once God does his work in you, God approves of you. He loves you more than your own parents do. Now in the last scripture here, Philippians chapter 1 in verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform it. I want you to look at it this way. God makes you. He starts at the back to the beginning. And then once he makes you, once you're born again, then he starts chipping away at you. Sometimes with a file, Sometimes with a hammer and a chisel. Sometimes with a chainsaw, maybe, if you're made of wood and you wouldn't move. But God starts working on you. And he will finish it. He will finish it. Hallelujah. Unto the day of Jesus Christ. There's one preacher that put it like this. What you don't learn here, you learn there. Our learning experiences will never stop. We will be forever looking at the face of Jesus in awe and wonderment at the revelations. For in the ages to come, he will show us the mystery of his grace as the universe has been flung out. It's keep going on, scientists telling us. It has been going on and stretching out and stretching out. We will never reach the end, even for the rest of eternity, because our body, now our spirit and our soul and our God are eternal. Hallelujah. Yes, there is a place for us. It's called the everlasting joy. But there's also a place for those who reject this God. It's called the eternal lake of fire that burneth with brimstone. And the Bible teaches us the smoke of their torment shall arise forever and ever. Can you imagine being in that awful place, knowing full well that you were once God's chosen, an apple of God's eye, but you rejected him. 
He paid for your sin. He gave everything he could have given, but you counted it as nothing. And there you sit for the rest of eternity, shouting and screaming and weeping because of the fool that you have been. So for those of you listening over television on the internet, you need to make this choice now. Today is the day of your salvation. Harden not your heart. If you're not sure about your salvation, then grab a hold of the hem of the garment of God. And don't let go till you know that you know. Because salvation, assurance of salvation is a revelation. It has to be revealed to you by God. And if you mean business, God will make himself known to you. Open your eyes to these incredible truths and become a blessing to yourself. Amen. Every eye shall see, every ear shall hear the sound of angels when he comes, when he comes. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. When he comes, when he comes, and he'll plant his beautiful feet upon this mountain, and the dead and all the ages who believed on him will rise. I'll be one, I'll be one in the first resurrection. When he comes, when he comes, when he comes. Everyone then will know that it's him, really him, the one and only. When he comes, when he comes, glorify and transform. I'll arise at his call, I'll be ready when he comes, when he comes. And he'll plant his beautiful feet upon this mountain, and the dead and all the ages who believed on him will rise. I'll be one, I'll be one in the first resurrection when he comes, when he comes, when he comes. I'll be one, I'll be one in the first resurrection when he comes.